All right. Hi, everyone. Ed Bixby here from the Global Green Burial Alliance, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly forum. We've got an exciting one tonight. I know people have been looking forward to this. So, Gretchen, if you'd like to introduce uh, our our guests. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Gretchen Spletzer with the Global Green Burial Alliance, and we are doing our July forum on uh, the ins and outs of natural cemeteries. Um, our guests are Stephanie Bonney from Panorama Natural Cemetery, um, Bill Gupton from Heritage Acre Memorial Sanctuary, and Steve Cooney from Serenity Ridge. I should have mentioned where these cemeteries are located. So Panorama with Stephanie is in Virginia, which it looks like that's a little northwest of Richmond, Virginia, I think, Stephanie? Yeah, it's pretty central. Yeah? We're, in, we're just above Charlottesville. Charlottesville, okay. And then Heritage, Heritage Acres in Cincinnati with Bill. Um, everybody pr pretty much knows where Cincinnati is, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and then Steve Cooney in, with Heritage Acres, and he's out in Baltimore, and we just did a spotlight with him um, recently, and I, I did put their contact info in the chat, and I will put their full bios in there as we get moving along here, but I know that we've got a lot to talk about, so... I wanted to get going with the um, conversations, but all three of them are just experienced in being in cemeteries and managing them, working with families. And um, so I really just thinking about this this week, I want to start with, you know, because I, I know a lot of people, it crosses their mind about opening a natural cemetery. Um, and so I thought a good place to start with would be talking about just the land. I, I remember um, being in a seminar seminar about cemetery design and just the things that you can do um, in a cemetery to support people who are going through grief and things, just not to mention how beautiful a natural cemetery is. So I'm gonna start with you, Bill, because I know you, you really were with Heritage Acres from the ground up. So how did you guys go about finding the land to do this in and how did how did that evolve uh that we spent two or three years uh searching for the right land uh we were we we are a nonprofit, and so we uh, uh were raising money to buy land meanwhile we were searching around the cincinnati metropolitan area uh for some land we in we were we got close a couple of times on a couple of pieces of land that we we were excited about but for various reasons uh the sale did not work out uh one of them would have been a an, an, an nice from a land perspective one of them on, in retrospect would not have been um but as has happened with everything since um there was some sort of uh, divine providence involved, and uh, we were we were sort of led to the right piece of land. Uh, when a uh, one of our founders, uh, being a nonprofit, we had we have set up a founders circle. So there were early adopters, shall we say, who contributed and and gave us seed money. One of our founders was uh, unfortunately uh, terminal, uh, dying with cancer, and uh, had. Uh, hospice was at home with hospice uh care and uh, nurses coming in every day and one of the nurses uh, she was always talking about she was trying to help this group find land for a green burial ground and we uh one day uh, one of the nurses said well i just drive by this place every day that has a sign uh about acreage for sale and it's got a phone number on it so we uh, uh she brought that phone number to uh, Connie was her name. Connie gave the phone number to me. I called the phone number and everything after that was just falling into place and it was meant to be. And it's, it's a, it's far and away. It, it is just a beautiful 40 acre piece of land that we, uh, have that the, uh, multi-generation, uh, farm family that owned it before is excited that we're 
uh, what, what about what we're doing, and they're very grateful that it's not becoming a subdivision, which is what it probably would have become. So uh, essentially, uh, in in cooperation with that family uh, and our founders, uh, we've we've pre <laughs> prevented a one particular subdivision from happening in one of the uh, suburbs of Cincinnati and uh, turned it into a natural burial ground. Yeah. Wow. That's nice that it all fell into place. Did you get any kind of pushback from neighbors or anything like that? I'd say that almost all the neighbors were were, were uh, either open-minded or, or supportive. Uh, there were a couple of neighbors who were uh, concerned, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think we've won them all over now. Um, oh, that's good. The, uh, the, the, the people's fears uh, tend to be unfounded and uh we're a good neighbor and and they're happy with what we're doing now oh that's one, good to hear. one thing i'd like to mention too and i'm bill i'm sure you're you're well aware of this for any of the of our viewers is that you know when you do look for that that piece of land you know just be cognizant of of uh, groundwater levels and things like that you have to really lean on your support system, you know, lean on the Global Green Burial Alliance, you know, ask a lot of questions because it's imperative to know that the land is, you know, going to be useful for burial. And interestingly enough, uh, Steve, I know that, you know, you're working with a similar situation with a family that had a farm that did not want to see it developed. Could you tell us a little bit about Serenity Ridge and why that family decided it would be better to create this kind of space? Let me unmute myself. Thank you, Ed. Um, so at, at Serenity Ridge um, up in Maryland, we work with, uh, you know, the Berg family has had this farm um, at least since the 60s. And the brothers inherited it from their father when he passed. You know, the the property sat for a long time um, and really in the community that we're in, um, we're part of the Patapsco Valley. Um, the community doesn't want to really see a lot of of development as, as many communities don't. So I think this property specifically, um, 177 acres, much of it just wilderness and 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 wild forests and, and rolling hills. Um, I think the family really just has good intentions. They didn't want the, the property developed. Um, the community didn't want the property developed. It sat there for so long. The property is beautiful. It's amazing. And I think that's one of the things that that's super special about Serenity Ridge here is just that, um, I mean, it, it, the, the way that the hills come together, the terrain of the property, there's a little stream that runs through the back, Ben's Run, um, and really just all the different diverse habitats and all the different animals and and, and everything out here. It's, it's just a beautiful, magical place. Yeah. Uh, I think... A lot of people who come out kind of feel that when they come out on the property, myself included. Um, so the property itself feels like a really special place. So rather than having something like this destroyed, uh, turned into townhouses or developments or anything else you could think of, um, you know, the family just wanted to to do something good with it. Just wasn't yeah. quite really sure what. And I think as natural burial, as the green burial movement came along uh, and kind of became a little bit more on people's minds and there was a little bit more exposure. I mean, what better place, what better thing to do with a place like this than, yeah. than turn it into a, a natural cemetery that's going to conserve and preserve the property, but also be utilized, not just like a beautiful place where people can walk around and enjoy the trail systems or visit the streams, but really use the property for, for natural burial uh, and also just for community, community space as well. So. Yeah, use the property and love the property because exactly I'm sure they do. And Stephanie Panorama, I was reading too, is also another cemetery that was from a family that had a farm, right? Yes, it's actually it's the, the family still owns the property. So Panorama Natural Burial is situated on an eight hundred and fifty acre chunk of private property that's owned by one family. Um, the Murray family uh, moved here in the 50s from New York um, with their, well, not with all of their eight sons, but with their soon-to-be eight sons. And um, 
it was an agricultural farm into the 90s. And then I think they kind of just saw the writing on the wall for a lot of small family farms and mm -hmm. shifted um, their business model to kind of um, focus on sustainable renewable resources. So we actually have a few different businesses on the property. Um, there's a um, composting business, um, not human composting. Um, I feel like I get asked that all the time. It's just a coincidence that it's a composting business. Um, right. uh, and then we also were the private running facility for the University of Virginia cross country team. So we have a lot of trails on the other side of the farm as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so Panorama Natural Burial is located on the um, backside of the 850 acres. So they're not, the businesses aren't on top of each other. You would never know if it wasn't for the name that they were connected. But yeah, it's the third business that's really just focused on keeping the developers at bay. It's such a, it's, I think it's the largest undeveloped chunk of land in the county. So Steve, wow. it sounds like it's a very similar um, story with us. So it's yeah. amazing the developers they will plan out all these plans for the land but they'll never include a cemetery it's happening here where i live there's eleven thousand homes approved but there's no cemetery planned and <laughs> nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody it's wants gonna to happen. address it that we need things like that until it's too yeah. late you know yeah and and the people who are starting cemeteries need support because there is pushback from neighbors sometimes and, you know, people need um, help in getting these things done. But, um, and, well, and just what's... you mentioning the things that also happen on the property. Um, and I know the other two cemeteries too, they don't have businesses, but they've got programs going on. You know, the Heritage Acre has the Arboreum and there's probably beekeepers at Serenity Ridge. Were you going to say something, Ed? And I just should mention my well, co-host, Ed, is also a natural cemetery guy, and I should have introduced that fact. That, yeah, that's, that, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Well, so, you know, I think what we've all hit on here for our audience is for them to understand that these places are uh, meant for, like, not only green recreation, but green commerce within all these communities. And they really, really can be used as a conservation tool. That is most important for people to understand that when a cemetery becomes a cemetery, it is a cemetery forever. So if it is a natural burial cemetery and it's forested, guess what? You have preserved the forest. And I think that is most important for people to understand. And what I would like to know from our guests today, because I'm sure lots of these people watching or you know, maybe interested in the idea of becoming a cemeterian, but maybe they don't understand the mechanics or the, you know, the heavy lifting that must be done. So, for instance, Bill, uh, expand a little bit about how long it did take you guys, not only to find the land, but to get through that initial permit process before you even put the first shovel in the ground. Because I think people need to understand that this is not something that's done overnight. So if you could enlighten the, the uh, our, our guests, that would be wonderful. Thanks, Ed. Um, yeah, th there were several years of groundwork, uh, pun intended, where uh, we were raising money, uh, we were putting systems in place, uh, creating a board of trustees and a founder's circle, um, searching for land, uh, doing research. Uh, one thing that we haven't mentioned yet is zoning. Uh, that, that it, you know, I'm in Ohio. Uh, it's prop things are probably similar in most states, but it is very, very crucial. Um, what the zoning uh, regulations are in any given uh, jurisdiction. So we have a lot of uh, little sub jurisdictions, little townships. We're in a township called Pierce Township, but that's really just a, a suburb of Cincinnati. But each township has their own zoning uh, regulations. And this particular piece of land, one of the things that made it uh, helpful for us to to proceed with this particular piece of land was that it was zoned uh, agriculture and a permitted use was cemetery. There was actually a, you know, 19th century family cemetery on the land because of a farm, right, from, from back actually pre-Civil War times. Um, so uh, the zoning 
was easier for us because we found a a property in a jurisdiction uh, where the zoning would, where a cemetery would be a permitted use, where, where there would be less ability to block or push back against making that land into a cemetery. Uh, I think people should, if they're thinking about uh, starting a natural burial ground, should definitely uh, look into the zoning in different locations that they're considering for land. Uh, I'm, I know that there are some uh, natural burial grounds where a, a person has donated land, uh, and, and that's kind of the emphasis that starts it, but you, you might be, uh, that might or might not be ideal in terms of uh, zoning and other regulations or in terms of terrain or topography or anything else. Sorry. Sorry? Uh, there's somebody needed to mute. I'll um, find them and mute them. Um, yeah. And so we, we also had, um, I mean, it is a heavy lift. Um, if you're going to start a green burial ground, I say, I, I, I tell people, you better be prepared to really be all in for a long, long time if not the rest of your life it's going to become all-consuming and uh you gotta you gotta love it yeah yes i've heard that too before very good point bill because i will say this that the most inexpensive way without you know putting yourself in a bad position is just to go to the zoning office and say to them simply can you show me where it's permissible within this community it's a very good advice, Bill. Thank you. Um, and I can just add that I did do that here in California, and it was the same. It had to be an ag zoned ag with cemetery also allowed in it. So it's probably pretty common, but you need to make sure. So is there water running through your Heritage Acres, Bill? Yes, uh, we have a creek. Oh, uh, that's nice. Runs through Heritage Acres. Uh, we have um, hiking trails in the woods that we have created. They weren't there before. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them go um, down to a overlook or go down to a creek and there's a little waterfall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's nice. I think that's nice. And um, what? how far do you have to keep bodies away from the water? I, I don't know if that's a nationwide. So, um, our restriction is 50 feet. Okay. Um, that was uh, what was so. It, one of the startup aspects of this was uh, go in, engaging in an environmental impact assessment study. So we contracted with a, a firm uh, to come do an environmental impact assessment of the property. Uh, 50, 75 page report about endangered species, about wetlands. We have four little wetlands on the property. Uh, about how far you need to stay away from the wetlands, from the creek, um, what areas are burial suitable, what areas aren't, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well. Um, and get the sound. Oh, hi, Mike. You're popping on here. Um, I'm going to mute him. If you just turn your Bluetooth off, it'll be fine. <laughs> Mike Mitchell, well, you can were just you texting mute yourself? coming through. Sorry, guys, I'll have to find them and mute them. Um. So, so Stephanie, uh, it sounds to me like Panorama really is like, you know, an anchor uh, in many ways for the community, you know, with the university and, and with different types of uh, industry going on, let's say, if, if you use that type of term. Uh, did, did there, did your employers or the family who owns it, did, did they have uh, difficulty finding uh, acceptance of this or how was that received in your community? And, and was it a positive or was it a negative experience? So that's a great question. A lot of what, you know, Bill was talking about, they handled before hiring me as the general manager. So I've kind of just gotten snippets of information from them. Um, I know, you know, the community had the opportunity to provide feedback and most of it was positive. You know, every now and then you get somebody that's just totally, totally against it. And it doesn't matter how you educate them. Um, they're just not going to change their perspective. Um, a lot of people in the community, because of the running trails, um, have 
kids or grandkids who have run on the property. So there's a really, you know, the family itself, like I said, it's eight brothers. They don't all live here, but um, a lot of them do. And so there's, you know, they've got a really, really uh, positive image in the community and they've done a lot for the community. So it's, it's really been a warm reception. And, you know, there are a handful of natural burial cemeteries in Virginia, but we're the only ones doing any type of community outreach. Um, you know, we're out there educating people and we're also inviting people onto the property for, you know, plant walks or, you know, we've got beekeepers. Um, we did like a geology rock walk, you know, we're doing yoga this weekend for the solstice. So um, it's, it's really been incredible. We've only been open for about a year and a half. And um, yeah, I'm just continually surprised by by how uh, how welcome it's been. Yeah, that's nice. I know, well, all three of you are, I think Bill too had a background in working with regular cemeteries, right? So um, what do you, like doing it this way, how is that for you? Like working with families in this capacity compared to before? I know I can um, just add my two cents real quick. So it's yeah. not unmuted um, already. Um, it's been really interesting. You know, the situation when I was up in New England was um, I was also managing a crematory, but it was a nonprofit crematory. It was completely unaffiliated with any funeral home. It was the only one in the state like that. So um, as far as the cemetery side, you know, it was 60 acres and we did a few burials here and there and it was old and it was gorgeous, but um, everything was kind of standard issue. You know, the greens, the the metal lowering device, the funeral homes all just kind of came in and did their thing. And mm -hmm. here, um, you know, here it's been a lot more curiosity, a lot more um, people just, you know, I'm sure Bill and Steve have experienced the same thing. People just really wanting to be involved. And they yeah. don't want the funeral homes taking charge of everything. And they, you know, ask a lot more questions. And um, yeah, you know, I was going to ask you, the, do you they ask a lot of questions? Because I feel like people are kind of cut off from that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And the only reason I brought up the crematory was because, you know, with it being a nonprofit, I was able to deal with the public one on one and they were able to bypass the funeral home for the cremations. Right. And that is sort of what kind of got me, got me to where I am now is like, I loved when people would just kind of embrace like being hands-on and like getting, getting their hands dirty, you know, and just, and, and, you know, I get a lot of people that would call me after the fact and say, I didn't think I could do it, but I did it. And I feel so yeah. grateful. And I really felt like I saw them through to the end. And, and I just get a lot more of that here than I ever did at the regular cemetery. Um, and so. probably because they feel that, like, I don't know that people get that feeling like I saw them through to the end, you know, like, let's right. do this together feeling when you do it the conventional way. Yeah. How about you, you, Steve? What about um, your experience as well? Is it the same? I would uh, completely agree with what, what Stephanie had to say um, from doing yeah. this in, in the traditional and the conventional setting. You know, it's all of us go in and and, and we want to just best serve families and take care of them um, here at a natural summit here at Serenity Ridge specifically, just the way that we're able to to really see families to through all the details, give them the time and the space to ask those questions. It's not rushed through like your appointments at 11, but I have another appointment at 12. So we have an hour to cover this information. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have any, you know what I mean? Like the, not that that happened all the time in a traditional or conventional cemetery, but there were times where, you know, it could just, you, you run into these, these kind of pinches that. Yeah. It's tricky when, when you want to just help families out and really yeah. hear, so many families have said that they they felt like they did everything that they could. Yeah. I never saw a family, uh, other cemeteries, walk away from a burial with a smile. It's not something that you expect as a cematarian or a funeral director or a crematory operator or anything. Um, yeah. But to hear families actually say, you know, and volunteer that information. I don't ask them why they're smiling. Yeah. 
um, to volunteer that information and say, wow, I really just feel like I did everything that I could. This is exactly what they wanted. Um, yeah. That That's what I love to hear. You know, yeah. and that's really what, what we want to just be about. So, and that's I, what I makes us so definitely. passionate, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So good. You fall in love with it. And just yeah. like, like Bill said, really, it's, it's consuming. Um, and really it's, it's, it's the planning and everything, but also the scene to the families, because yeah. I mean, really, it, it, we don't all work on a nine to five schedule. You know, sometimes yeah. people are working and they can't get you a check until seven o'clock at night. And it's difficult for them to drive here or there. And you know what I mean? There's, mm -hmm. there's ways that we can really just you know, go outside of, of the normal business parameters to, to help families through the tough times. Yeah. You almost become like a temporary surrogate family to get them through that hard time. Cause they really are devastated a lot well, of times. I know how I was when it happened to me, it's so hard. Well, the, the one thing I think that, that, that the listeners need to know is that you're, with an actual burial, you're sharing an intimate experience. Uh, your interactions with the family are so vast that they actually, you almost become part of their friends and family network because you're helping them through the toughest time of their life. So I think it's really important to understand the importance of these types of facilities that, you know, like uh, Bill and Steve and, and, and Stephanie have said, you know, that it's hard to explain the feeling when you see someone that's grief stricken walk away smiling. It's because they're content knowing that they've done everything that they, that they can do. And me as a cemeterian, I can tell you, you know, uh, I think Bill had said, you know, you become passionate, you know, it led me, we're all over the country and, and it can be done to the listeners. I want them to understand that it may seem like a long road to hoe, but you know, you have to be committed and, and if I were to ask the three of you to share with our listeners, you know, you know, what was what, what do you feel like is the, the largest obstacle for the would-be cemeterian? And how should they take that obstacle in stride? If you guys could share some of your wisdom, some of your experience, I think that that would be that would be really appreciated uh, by the listeners. Yeah, I'll pick up on that, Ed. I, I think truly the, the biggest uh, challenge is the is the uh, all consuming nature of the thing, and the the the, but what makes you what makes it possible to to lean into that is what Steve was talking about. Um, that people families leave uplifted. Uh, it is so rewarding and fulfilling, and you do become part, as you said, uh, an intimate part of of that grief process that these people are going through. Uh, to reference the intensity, um, last Friday slash Saturday, we had three burials in 22 hours. Um, certainly not something I ever imagined when I said, I'm going to start a green burial ground. Now we're in a major metropolitan area. There's a lot of demand. Uh, these are things I hadn't thought through, but one of those three um, was a, a four-year-old girl who had died in a car wreck um, that her and her father was driving the car. He survived. Um, a few days after the wreck, he's out at Heritage Acres with his uh, brothers and some other men from the family, and they're digging his daughter's grave. Oh. We're helping supervise, but family members can take the shovel to the ground at Heritage Acres. Not all of them do, probably only five or 10% of them do. But when they do, that's even a deeper uh, involvement in the, in the process and the grief process and, and the catharsis thereof. Um, so I think it, it is indescribably rewarding uh, to uh, help families through such a process. Makes it, makes all the, late night phone calls and all the laying awake at night wondering about zoning or whatever makes it all worth it. Yeah. yeah. And even if you're not a cemetery and helping families get educated and in, in information just makes you want to volunteer all the time to tell everybody. Because Well, so you just used the word volunteer and I, and I want to <laughs> say we have dozens of, vo of volunteers at Heritage yeah. Acres. We, we have staff, but we also have a whole lot of volunteers because people want to participate and be part of and make this possible for the 
community. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful, Bill. I'm so glad to hear that because I remember when you guys were getting it all together and I'm just so glad to hear that it's turning out so well. In fact, all of the natural burials that I know of are successful. I don't think I've ever heard of one that has not been successful. Can't think of one. I mean, maybe somebody knows one, but I don't. <laughs> So, now, if you're serving the community, you're if you're serving the community, you're going to be successful. It might take a little time sometimes, but you know, if you build it, it will come. So, yeah, attested by these individuals. And um, was it Ser Serenity Ridge? I think on your website you have a list of green burial funeral director providers, don't you? I liked that because not all of them do support it. And so it's nice on your website that you have the, you know, the, the folks that you work with. So people, if they go to your website, they can find a funeral director. And yeah. for, I mean, I'm glad more and more funeral directors are willing to help families with this. So that's nice to see. And we try to just have the resources available to folks, you know, because it's really, it's their selection on the funeral home or, or the provider that they want to choose. But if we can just kind of help get them in the right direction, because, you know, I think we've talked before so many times when there's a death or a loss in the families, families oftentimes just almost like ditto copy and paste what may have happened with the last death in the family. Yeah, they go to the same totally. family funeral home and they repeat the same kind of arrangements and just alter some details. And, you know, with yeah. natural burial being so new, any resources we can get to families that'll help them get to, to providers to make it easier, the better. Yeah. And unfortunately the um, do it all over again, routine is often cremation. And then people, a lot of times, completely miss out on the death ritual, which is so important to our lives. So, yes, that's important. Um, and I wanted to ask you guys, like, when you have, maybe you're working with a funeral director and it's the funeral director's, like, first time dealing with a green burial family. What's that like? Like, do any of you have that, have had that experience? How they handle it? Are they... Are they open to it afterwards? You know, anything juicy like that? <laughs> I'll hop in on well, this. Um, I've I've gone around because again, from being in the in the the profession, um, for a little while, and especially in this area, I I've made some good connections with funeral directors already which I think was also very helpful in that like I knew a lot of funeral directors who would already kind of be open-minded to this or kind of already were following one with trends and kind of knew this was coming. Just we needed more natural spaces, more natural cemeteries. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sure they I got can... the call. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and, and we've also had, had funeral homes that I haven't worked with that have called and I've walked them through the arrangements and got them in like, um, the, um, different resources where they can, they've even called and asked back and forth. Is this casket? Okay. Is this casket? Okay. Is this casket? Oh, okay. Nice. Um, yeah. and that's just fine. We even encourage families that if they have a local funeral home that they use, as long as that funeral home's equipped to do a natural burial, most of them can. It's just whether or not they're willing to. So mm -hmm. if a family has a funeral home that they've always used, we don't want them to break that tradition. If that funeral home is willing to work with the family, have them give us a call and we can help walk them through everything. Oh, that's nice. That's good. Well, well put, Steve. And and just, you know, if you're looking for juicy, Gretchen, I, I'll share a little juicy for <laughs> okay. you and the and the and and the and the viewers. So Believe it or not, uh, you know, in my life going on 20 years experience of doing this, most funeral directors that only do traditional types of funerals don't really handle unembalmed bodies. So when they get approached by a family that wants a natural burial, they really, like Steve said, don't really understand what exactly they're offering to the family in many ways. So, Steve, you're absolutely correct. You have to be educated in a way, and this goes to all the people watching this, if you want to be a would-be cemeterian, as to the nuts and bolts of what the funeral director will provide for a natural burial family, you know, which would be refrigeration and transportation and permits. And, and you have to let them know how important it is that they're charging for their, for their service, not for a product. So 
I guess the juicy part is nine out of 10 funeral directors not familiar with natural burial are too afraid to actually ask for help. But when they realize they can lean on people like ourselves, like Bill, Stephanie, or Steve, it becomes much easier, it builds a better rapport. So, yeah. I, you know, hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's true. I, I think you're right totally about that, Ed. Um, yeah. Gretchen? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, it, we've created a, a one page sheet of mm -hmm. what we need from a funeral home to have a green burial at Heritage Acres. So when there's a new uh, funeral home that we haven't worked with before, I send them the one page sheet. They find that really helpful. We do, uh, uh, wow. you know, as, as um, Steve was saying, a lot of back and forth texting and phone calls with, with the uh, funeral home about walking them through the process, uh, what they're gonna do, what they're not gonna do. Most of them are very uh, curious about is this okay? Is is this what do we do with about zippers or or buttons yeah. or belts or you know all kinds of things like that? Um, I, I expected a lot more resistance from funeral directors in the town than than we've actually had. People yeah. seem to be uh, open. Uh, they come out the first time. There's always sort of a, you get the sense that they're checking you out to see if you know what you're doing or if you're or this is just a bunch of crazy people who yeah. were doing this thing out in the woods or whatever. But when they see that we know what we're doing, we have a system and it's everything's very well taken care of, the family's very well uh taken care of, then 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 they then they're into it. They're like, oh, this I, I had no idea. And so we'd happy to work with you again and so on. Yeah. Yeah, that is that's great because um I, I know when I was at the GBC, a funeral directors would call too about caskets or when COVID was happening, you know, how to take care of that and stuff. And um, and I found that their curiosity was really sweet, that they were willing to call, you know, and ask. So I and I, and I think that's that's good. And as more families want it, I think more people will call. And and sometimes I've thought you know, some of the funeral directors are more open to it than the cemeteries, like the hybrids, for example, you know. Um, but that's changing, too. Thank God. We're getting more hybrids that are offering it as um, their communities ask for it. But that's really what makes the change is the community wanting it and asking their local cemeteries to offer it. So everybody yeah. listening out there, go to your cemetery and ask them that tell them you want a natural burial it's you know, Gretchen, oh, oops. I, I just want to make a quick point stephanie i'm sorry to interrupt just just so everyone knows on this call natural burial uh is perfectly legal in all 50 states just so everyone knows so it's not something that you know it needs to be zoned correctly yes but it's it's permissible it really does come down to the cemetery itself and its rules and regulations go ahead stephanie sorry about that Oh, no, I was just going to say, I've actually found um, that, you know, I think I had one day when we first opened or right before we got our permits cleared that I just like reached out to every funeral home within like a one hour radius or even further. And, you know, I had like zero response. And that's sort of what I expected because, you know. Uh, yeah. we, we had some funeral homes in Charlottesville that were super excited because mm -hmm. people in Charlottesville had been asking, like, are we going to do something like this soon or, you know, but um, I found that people meet with us first a lot of the times and then they ask for a referral to like, you know, they say, who do you work with? And obviously we work with everybody, you know, yeah. but we have a few people we can recommend, but um, it's almost just kind of piggybacking Gretchen on what you were saying is it's people are going to their funeral homes, you know, and they're saying, I, I want to be buried at Panorama. And it's kind of pushing the funeral homes a little bit. Um, you yeah. know, those funeral homes that didn't want to really give me the time of day in the beginning now are, are calling me and establishing relationships. So it, it is the community yeah. for sure. Yeah. They're like, hello, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's good. I, you know, it's so interesting to me because like a state like Virginia or, or some of the Southern states where 
people, you know, are about freedom and wanting the most simple option a lot of times, like, you know, their ancestors had, like, on one hand, there's that desire. And then on the other hand, there's this tradition that's only about 100 years old, but it's the way it's been done in the last two generations. And so I think because people don't really think it through, they don't know for sure what they want when they die. So they have almost like two things going on in their head. You know, what my family's always done and then this simplicity way. So I also encourage people to really think about what you want. And um, I was just saying this on the last interview we did to plan and let your family know what you want. <laughs> Get a green burial planner, and it, it could even be just written on a piece of paper would be helpful. So, um, and I just also want to mention the green burial um, movement is growing a lot. Right, Ed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have to understand that, you know, we're having a conversation now, and all of these cemeteries are located here in the Northeast area, Mid-Atlantic. Uh, but, you know, this is a, this is a global you know, a global movement, uh, you know, every human being alive, we share this experience with them. Mm -hmm. And it's important that, you know, people like yourselves, Bill, Steve, Stephanie, that, you know, you can help lead the way with inspiration so that they feel like, you know what, this can be done, you know, in my neighborhood. And I do have the assistance and the Global Green Burial Alliance is here to say to everyone on this call that if you have the questions, if you need the, the shoulder to lean on, feel free to lean on us. We want you to be successful. We want to see the successes. And we have a network of people who can attest to the successes that we've had, just like this group. And uh, it's well worth the effort. And I'm sure that there's people on this call that probably have some questions for all of us. Uh, I don't know if it's too early for that, but I think it might inspire some other conversation as well. So uh, I don't know if we're monitoring that or how we're doing questions, yeah. but if anyone yeah, has well, anything really important, I think we should address it. Um, there is one here, get my glasses from, actually I can scroll back because I know a couple came through. Um, it was from, oops. Can the speakers tell us about their staff, how many staff they have, also what ways were involved in raising money to purchase land? I'm part of a group looking for land in Mid Coast, Maine. Maybe Bill would be good on that one, huh? So I mentioned uh, uh, staff. Uh, uh, when we started, uh, we were all volunteer. Um, Heritage Acres was my um, uh, personal project and brainchild all, all along. So I was putting in countless uh, volunteer hours. We had, like I said, we had dozens of volunteers. But as we uh, made sales and got... Uh, our finances uh, stabilized. The uh, first thing we invested in was a land steward uh, to uh, take care of the of the property of, of nature of of our of our sacred space. Um, the land steward started out part time. Uh, now the land steward now there's a full time land steward. Uh, it got to the point where I was able to come on to start getting paid as well. We uh, have a part-time administrative assistant. We have a, uh, uh, a bookkeeper that's a contract, you know, hourly rate kind of bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, those are the people that are, and, and we pay most, but not all of our grave diggers. Um so those are the people that get paid and we opened four years ago. So that's, that's pretty rapid. That's yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. The, the, the raising money. I mean, the fact that we're a nonprofit was helpful because people can donate and it's a tax deductible donation. Mm -hmm. um, but we started with, as I said, a, a founder circle and those people were sort of initial investors as, as it were and they got some uh benefits for that uh, including you know their own burial 
Um, right. Yeah. And I've seen people do, um, there's one in California in Fresno who did a GoFundMe for hers. Yeah. Um, so that's also a possibility because, you know, and if you're sharing it with your community that believes in it, they'll donate to it. So uh, let's see, we got, and then there was another question, let's see, from Michelle, where was it? Well, I think Stephanie, Ste I know that uh, Panorama went out and hired from, from outside of town uh, a, a high quality cemetery and with experience, which is you. So maybe Stephanie should talk about the process, you know, the staff situation at Panorama. Yeah. That, that's very quick as well for them. Oh, thanks for the compliment, Bill. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> So it was, yeah, it was just me for the first six months. And then it was just kind of, we were so busy right off the bat and it was really overwhelming. And I think that was to be expected because like a lot of the neighbors were super interested and there was definitely like this bubble initially. Um, but I was, I was giving tours so often that I could barely keep up with paperwork. Um, and so I found um, an assistant manager and she was just part-time. She is just part-time. And um, she just moved to West Virginia and I'm devastated. So we've, we've hired a replacement, Ryan, and he's brand new. So Liz is still, she's still alive and well, <laughs> but um, yeah, I miss her. Um, she was outstanding. And yeah, a, cu a couple of months later, I, so it's probably, we were seven or eight months in, maybe just seven. Um, we hired another part-time employee, Megan, and she handles all of our, um, event programming. So all the amazing activities and a lot of the community outreach and things like that. Um, whereas Liz is yeah. more, she was more on the land steward side, which yeah. is what Ryan's doing. And there's definitely some overlap. You know, anybody can jump in at the burials, like neither position, you know, the original assistant manager, you know, and Ryan, neither of them knew exactly what was going on with like burials. Nobody's had any cemetery experience, um, but, you know, I've been able to catch them up. And so there's, there's a lot of really great synergy. Um, but so, I mean, if you do the math, it's like two full-time employees um, right now. I think it could very easily be, you know, two full-time employees and a part-timer or, you know, a contractor or something to do some of the advertising or, you know, uh, advertising is so touchy and it's such a, it's a different animal in this industry. Yeah. Um, and so I think we're still trying to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't, and we want to do it, but we don't want to do it in the wrong places or the wrong way. So yeah. just trying to figure out what makes the most sense, I think, but that's what we have right now. Yeah. Um. And then um, Mike has a question. What do the graves cost and how much are the openings and closings in each of your cemeteries? And we'll start, Stephanie, since you're already unmuted. So our spaces range from four to 6,000. It's tiered pricing based on section. Um, and that's just based on availability um, in, in the long term. Um, we've got three different sections. We've got a meadow, a forest, and then kind of an in-between area. So the pricing um, is determined by what section you want to be buried in. Mm -hmm. um, and then we work with a contractor. So the opening and closing reflects that it's 1600 right now. Um, and with our pricing, you know, we considered the other natural burial cemeteries in Virginia and then cemeteries in Charlottesville. So yeah. as far as natural burial cemeteries in Virginia, we're kind of right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then we're on the low end of competitive with the other cemeteries in Charlottesville. Yeah, I'm, um, I've noticed cemetery grade prices are very much contingent upon where their the cemeteries are. Hollywood the cemetery forever. I was managing in Vermont, the spaces were six hundred dollars. Wow! So yeah, it was That's cheap. Definitely, definitely a bit of a reality check when I moved here. <laughs> That's the cheapest I've ever heard of. I know Hollywood for Hollywood Forever is like thirty thousand or something like that in their green space. <laughs> All right. Well, how about you, Bill? What's your price? 
So, so I just put a link to our price list in the uh, chat. Oh, okay. But I'm not, you know, the uh, our body burial uh, plots are three thousand. Uh, cremation burial ranges from nine fifty to nineteen fifty. We do a lot of cremation burials. Um, we dig all our graves by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the grave digging fee is pretty low. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's seven fifty right now. Um, so, uh, a, a person as, as someone put it to me the other day, a person is all in for a body burial at heritage acres for 37 50, mm -hmm. uh, at this time, Yeah, that's a but good they time. can't prepay. They, they actually can't prepay the grave digging fee uh, because, uh, we, that's only at time of need. So an at yeah. need burial right now would be 37 50, uh, for us. Uh, obviously they have other costs with a funeral home. Yeah. That's a great price. And how about you, Steve? So we have two different sections that are available now. There's like the area in the front we call valleys and meadows. And then the other spot, Inspiration Point, which is closer to like the woods. Uh, it's like more near the forest. The spots back there are 3500 And then the interment fee is $2,125. Um, up front in the valleys and meadows, it's 1925 for the spot and 1925 for the burial. So just kind of like short summary, we can do a burial today in the, the front in the valleys and meadows is about 4,000 and in Inspiration Point, it's a little less than six. Yeah. That's about the average I, oh, for all of you guys. I've we heard. include the, uh, not really include, but we provide a stone to the family too. Like we put that oh, the memorial right. stone down. So we get a, a, a Maryland native field stone and get that inscribed with the loved one's name and dates. And that goes down at the grave site. It's not a cost to the family or built in or anything. It's just uh, really ensures everybody in the cemetery will have a, a, a memorial and a marker. Yeah, because those that's a whole nother ordeal. Right. right. Um, and so do they do you have like a pile of rocks or something that they can go pick through and pick it out or how do we don't have the ability for people to pick through them or anything like that, uh, but we'll we'll pick a stone, we'll provide it and, and we'll get the names etched in. Oh, that's great. That's a good that's a nice little extra service. Yeah. Um we okay, have a pile of rocks. You do? <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> nice. I didn't realize how much of the the stone is like, you got to pick out the stone, the font, the, you know, how it's going to be engraved. Like, there's a lot to that. I actually just um, want to make a comment about that. So I took a tour of a couple of natural burial sites before really getting going last year. And one of the things that I found um, was that, you know, you could be out in this gorgeous natural setting and I found it visually jarring, um, when there were just different fonts and different, you know, this person has Bible verses, this person has, you know, very plain, they just have their initials or something. So we actually, we have one font we do first middle, if you have, or want one last and then birth and death year. And there's nothing else. If you want, you know, to list your your rank in the military or something we'll we'll allow for that um you know we recently have been working with the jewish synagogue to put in a jewish section and they had asked about engraving a small star of david we're open to that too but um we keep it pretty uniform um just because we don't want it to take away from the natural setting at all yeah and i know some people some people are a little disappointed but i have told them you know if you want to bring a stone or something that's not going to be set in the ground that you know mm -hmm. you can add so i've had some people bring stones with like pets names or something that they've put around the memorial stone we'll allow that so yeah. that allows a little more individuality but the stone that's actually set in the ground is very simple and it's pretty uniform that's nice um that reminds me what i wanted to also ask you guys um because i know ed comes with it uh, comes across this a lot in your cemeteries do you get approached by um, like Jewish groups or Muslim groups about getting a section in the cemetery or group burials? So you had mentioned that with the Jewish group, right, Stephanie? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if somebody is Jewish, they can be buried anywhere. Um, but yeah, we've had yeah. several. Actually, I think I mean that was in the works well before I ever showed up. It's uh, just recently yeah. been settled. Um, I think the synagogue went through a couple of different 
um, iterations of their um, cemetery commission and their leadership. So there were some, I think, dropped balls on both sides. And so we finally got everything ironed out. Um, and then I actually did have somebody from a Muslim community um, reach out recently. And I don't know, at first I was kind of, the idea of like everybody having their own section kind of feels a little counterintuitive to me, but yeah. I totally understand that that's part of the religious tradition. So, so yeah, I mean, I wonder we're, if they we're would, definitely willing to explore it. Yeah. I wonder if they could buy like 15 plots and then intermix them, if they'd be open to that or if they actually want it, maybe each group is different, what sex, how they want to do it. Did I, you? I think, help? Oh, go ahead, Ed. No, no, no. I, I was just going to mention, you know, that, you know, we've, we've helped thousands of families and, you know, from every faith walk of life, sexuality, gender, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we're all human beings. And what I have found, and I, you know, again, every type of religion you could possibly imagine, uh, they lay side by side. And I find the irony in it is, you know, sometimes we can't get along in life, but somehow we can, we can get along in death. And, and I don't believe, you know, it's in particular in any of our facilities that anyone's ever required a section uh you know if you believe in what we do uh, you certainly have the right to believe in your own religious beliefs and if it fits the mold you know you'll come and, and we do it we do it every day and, and i think i'm sure that this will happen for bill and stephanie and, and steve if it hasn't already but the one thing i did want to say everybody folks is that you know it is it's approaching the hour and i know some people you know may have things to do so i just want to be cognizant of that. Uh, I do want to say that the Global Green Burial Alliance, you know, greatly appreciates uh, Bill, Stephanie, Steve, you know, for you to come and share your insight. Uh, we, I'm sure we have other questions. I, I hope we can make your, uh, your information available to our viewers so that maybe uh, you can answer some questions after this. But uh, is there any, any final thoughts that anyone would like to lend to tonight's discussion? Well Ed, there's one question here that I just, we've got, it's from Carrie, and it's such a great question. So I want to- Go ahead. Where is it? I lost it. Where is she? Um, it's about this old cemetery. Wow. Oh. She there. says, it, um, I have yeah. an opportunity to take over uh, an old cemetery that has an area with no burials that could be used for natural burial. The current caretakers are not organized in any way and have about $7,000 in their account. Is this legal for me to do? Any pointers or advice? I'm going to meet with them Sunday at the cemetery. That's, that's why we had to take this question because this is one of my favorite topics and I'll let you answer it, Ed. <laughs> All right, so so Carrie, understand this. So I, it really has a lot to do with the formation of your organization. You're either going to be what's considered a C-13 nonprofit uh, cemetery company, or you could be a religious entity, but you have to be one of one or the other in order to take possession of the cemetery itself. Uh, you know, there's no reason you can't do that. You know, I mean, uh, all of my 14 cemeteries uh, are historic cemeteries. No, actually, I should take that back. We have one uh newly developed one in Minnesota, but 13 of them are, so I commend you for your efforts. But uh, I would meet with them on Sunday and just know that if you were to, to take on this endeavor, you have to make a decision as to how you would like to proceed, either as a religious corporation or as a C-13 uh, cemetery company. So uh, if you need any more information concerning that, I'd be more than glad to speak to you uh, offline. To help yes. you or assist you in that in that discussion if need be and and this is exactly why the global green burial alliance is doing what we do is for questions like that because these inf the information is hard to find you could spend hours on google trying to find how to you know where, where would you find the answer to that only ed knows no i'm just kidding but, <laughs> <laughs> but only a few people can answer questions like that because we're starting we're just starting to share all this knowledge uh, well, not just starting, Absolutely. but I mean, you know, there's a lot to learn about cemetery and all of this. So 
that's why we're here. And I'm just ever so grateful to Stephanie, Steve, and Bill for taking out their time to be with us and help us share this information. And we're, yep, and we're going to keep doing it. Um, and I have some good ideas. Uh, next month's forum is going to be on the state of Kentucky and their green burial situation. So I'm excited about that one. And um, we'll just keep going, everybody. So thank you, and um, and we'll see you next time. And this will be recorded, so if anyone you know wants wants it and missed it, it'll be on YouTube and our Facebook page. Thanks, everybody. Hey, it's great. Thank you for great. having us. Okay, thank you. Very well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.